Edinburgh SWIFT project officer. She's uh, joining us tonight to tell us about the Edinburgh SWIFT city project funded by Scottish Power Foundation and how one can get involved in such activities. The aim of the project is to protect and enhance SWIFT population via conservation and community outreach. This looks like putting up SWIFT nest box, doing foraging research and training up the newly established Edinburgh, Edinburgh SWIFT local group. A particular season focus right now is doing as many SWIFT surveys as possible this summer. So I'm certainly a big fan of SWIFTs. Uh, um, we were just having a quick chat with Katie and I've yet to see my first one and I'm very much looking forward to this talk. So uh, Katie, uh, over to you. Oh, there is it. Am I in real time still? Yeah. We, we, yeah. yeah, it's okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah, um, you're, you're fine. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for coming. I know that some people are feeling a bit of Zoom fatigue recently, so um, I'm really glad that you were still able to come. Um, and it's exciting to be here for the last uh, meeting that you have before your summer break. So I, I got you just in time. And um, so I just got your presentation for today. And just begin. Um, are you recording OK or do you need to click record? I think I, I see it's recording. It is so, recording. Yeah, mm -hmm. Cool. I've done that before. I've started with like uh, recording. Okay. Um. So yeah. And thank you, Nick, for the introduction as well. Um. So before we begin, I just wanted to set the scene with a little poem about the the swift that's just joining us now back in Edinburgh. So it goes: Butterflies are fluttering, bluebells unfurling, but the true sign of summer is the wee swift returning. She's travelled here over 7,000 miles, up to 70 miles per hour and facing endless trials, opportunistically feeding at 50 metres high, storing a bolus of a thousand insects for when rations run dry. A life in the wing means nine months in the sky and three months to nest. She used to land in sea cliffs and hollow trees, but now in buildings she'd rather rest. Into roof eaves she went and that would indeed do but now with development and demolition that's gone too in 23 years numbers went down by 58 percent an amber listed species that we cannot allow to be further spent but then we remember that in cultures past the wee swift was a sign of hope that would last you can still help by giving nature a home and make edinburgh a swift city where they where they will be free to roam and so that was artwork by sam and the rest of the talk is basically this in a wee bit more detail. <laughs> um, so I'll say a wee bit about the project, uh, the fantastic SWIFT that I've been bending people's ear about for the past year, um, threats that they face, uh, what we can do about them, and um, really inspiring uh, examples in Edinburgh. Um, and then two things at the end that I would be um, inviting you to take part in if you're able to, uh, SWIFT surveys and SWIFT awareness. So the Edinburgh SWIFT Cities project, as Nick said, uh, the aim of it is to protect and enhance the SWIFT populations within Edinburgh through conservation and community engagement. Due to COVID, I, um, I've been able to re reach out uh, much further than Edinburgh, so I've been working on the Scotland level and also on the UK level, um, and the project runs until this August, uh, funded by Scottish Power Foundation. Um, so a wee bit more detail about what we'll be getting, what we have been getting up to. Um, so doing the SWIFT surveys, which I'll say a bit more about later, installing the SWIFT nests, uh, lo looking at um, habitat enhancement um, through uh, planting trees and wildflowers, because uh, the SWIFTs eat the insects and they live because um, of the wildflowers. Uh, looking at caseworks, so looking at development within Edinburgh and how to respond to development to suggest SWIFT uh, nests and SWIFT bricks being added to the uh, development plans. Also doing uh, research into their foraging behaviour. That basically helps us to focus the conservation efforts. If we know where they forage, we know where to focus the habitat uh, management and enhancement and conservation. Um, and also doing things like this. So reaching out to different networks and um, working on a professional level and a community level uh, to do workshops and basically do a sing and dance about the SWIFTs um, and get everybody interested that isn't already. So I'll have a wee quiz for you here. 
Um, I'm not going to ask you to actually answer, so it's just a wee internal quiz. You can mark it yourself. Um, but there's the swift and there's two other birds that people very, very commonly get confused by, um, which is very understandable because in the sky they look extremely similar. Um, so I wonder if you know which one is the swift. See some nods there. Okay, I'm going to go for it. You ready? Three, two, one. <gasps> this is the swift. And the other ones here are the swallow and the house martin. And how I distinguish them is if you look at the tail of the swift, and um, that's short and forked, whereas the swallow, if you think of the swallow tail jacket, um, has really long tails. Uh, the way I distinguish between the house martin and the swift is that the house martin has got a white belly, whereas the swift has got a dark belly. They're actually um, a kind of dark browny colour, but they appear black in the sky. Um, and how I remember that, <laughs> random, but white house. So the house martin has got a white belly. Um, so these are the ways that I remember them. And I share that with people of all ages to, to try and help everybody remember. So we have a bit more detail about what they look like. They've got these crescent shaped wings and a friend described them as looking anchor shaped, um, which I thought was a really good description as well. Uh, the short forked tail and appears back in flight. They've got this wee white tuft um, whenever they're juveniles. So they're kind of like the opposite of humans where they, they lose, they're born with their white hair and they lose it, um, which, is, which is a bit different to us. Um, and in terms of their size, they're uh, 15 inches from on their wingspan and seven inches, um, they're like nose to tail. Um, I just kept this in because I was doing a talk recently about the nature prescriptions that RSPB is doing at the minute. Um, and that's kind of in incorporating well-being and nature. Um, it's Mental Health Awareness Week this week and the theme is Connect to Nature as well. Um, and so, yeah, I was doing a talk about that. And it's just a wee invitation that um, maybe now to help you concentrate or when you're outside next, if you make a little shape of a swift, um, it can help you remember the shape of them, but it's also very therapeutic and enjoyable to do. And they'll also uh, tie that into something later on. There's a creative campaign going on for the swift. Um, so some more information about this wonderful bird. They've got these really dark, deep-seated eyes um, and bristles along them to keep out any debris um, as they fly. They live for about 5.5 uh, years on average, but there were ones that was um, there was one that was tagged and found to live for 18 years. Um, so that swift in its lifetime, it's believed, would have flown the distance of um, flying to the moon and back four times, um, which is pretty impressive. Um, so the actual swift are, is impressive for many reasons. Um, it's built for serious speed, stamina and skill. So it is the fastest uh, bird at level height that's been recorded. It has very close competition with, with its cousin, um, which is the needle-tailed swift. Um, that is believed to possibly fly faster, but it's not been recorded. So at the minute, the common swift, the Apis Apis, has still got the... Um, still got the badge for the fastest. Um, it's got serious stamina. Um, so this is its feeding range, breed, breeding range in the summer in the, in the yellow of the map, so in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the winter, it goes um, down south. In our winter, it goes down south to the um, Southern Hemisphere. It's very lucky. It follows the sun its whole life. And a wee bit here as well about the name of the, the swift um, is Apis Apis. And if, um, you don't know already, it means uh, it's Greek for without foot. Um, and not because it doesn't have feet, it obviously has feet, but um, their feet are uh, not really that suitable for landing. So whenever they land, they sort of just fall over. They're not, they're not, they, they fly so often um, that they're not accustomed to landing on the ground. Um, and their feet are actually extremely strong. And um, they kind of look like chameleon feet. So they go side to side instead of kind of normal front facing toes um, and yeah I just really like that about the the Latin name of animals they often say a little description about the bird um, and what people used to think of them. Uh, so on, still on, the, on the note of stamina this is the um, distance that the swifts fly every single year and um, they go the whole way down to that little yellow circle is above the Congo and um, there's a massive rainforest there lots of insects and then it goes down to the coast there, all the way down to Malawi. 
um, before flying back up again. Um, so it spends literally nine months flying without any breaks um, and comes back. The only time it lands is whenever it's in the nests of Edinburgh and of the UK. Um, so if you think about that whole distance and it's the weight of a cream egg um, is pretty impressive. This was um, this map was created by the BTO when the SWIFT was tagged with the geolocator, um, and that's how this map was um, able to be produced. They used to believe that the SWIFTs um, slept in mud over the winter, um, but then it was actually found out that they migrate the whole way down to the continent of Africa. Um, so they're, they're flying nonstop for nine months and they're doing literally everything on the wing. They're eating, drinking, bathing and mating on the wing. Um, and whenever they bathe, they go through rain cloud and they kind of go really slowly um, and get a nice, a nice bath and then fly on after that. And as you can see at the bottom left, they, whenever they want to drink, they skirt along the bottom of a river or a water base. Um, as I said in the poem at the start, they can store up to a thousand insects in a little um, pocket in their beak, which is also very impressive. But my favourite fact about them, which I find just so phenomenal, they obviously have to sleep in the wing as well. So they have this thing called a uh, unihemispherical slow way of sleep, where they basically turn half their brain off and, and fly with the others. So they go up 50 metres high and kind of drift in the, the air waves that are up there with half their brain off. <laughs> Um, so it's like dolphins as well, but I just find that um, amazing. <laughs> and so these are the little swiftlets. They weren't always as cute. This is them whenever they're first born. And so you can really see the era that they evolved in by this picture. Um, and the swifts pair for life, they meet back at the nest every year. They lay between one and three white eggs. Um, it takes up to 56 days to hatch. At four weeks old, they literally start doing press ups inside their nest. So they, they go against their wings and, and move up and down to strengthen their wings. And um, because at six weeks old, they, they leave the nest and they fly. And that first time they leave the nest, they fly nonstop for two years until they're mature enough to mate. And um, so they literally don't land for two years at the start of their life. So they have to do these press ups <laughs> to get fit enough. Um, so another quiz for you. I wonder if you might know when Swifts evolved. Um, so hopefully you can see it a little tiny. If you can't see it that well, it is quite small writing, but if you can just give a guesstimate about when they evolved. Okay, so da, 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 da. they will evolve way down here. I don't know if you guessed that or not, but it's about 60 million years ago. And um, so whenever the T-Rex died out is when the Swift evolved, um, which is a really long time ago um, and quite fantastic. And here's just something to laugh about the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so despite being so old um, or to have evolved such a long time ago, um, just in the last 23 years, um, the numbers have reduced by, it's actually 58%. So this st statistic is from 2016, but it's now 58% in 2018, um, which is obviously very sad. Um, and they're now classed as an amber conservation status. Um, and an RSPB priority species since 2009. Um, and amber, I find the, the color system of the conservation status, there's just red, amber, and green. Um, and there's subdivisions within that, but amber sounds like it's not that bad, but it's like on the brink of being classed as this is going to go extinct kind of thing. So it is definitely um, something we need to focus our efforts onto, which is great that this project exists. Um, so why is this? Well, there's a few things that are considered. Um, these two examples aren't proven by science. There's one that is, um, but it almost kind of makes sense if you think about it. 
and um, so the swifts eat the insects and you'll uh, might know yourself about um whenever you drove 20 or 30 years ago there would be loads of insects on the screen and um, that have been squashed whereas now you don't really experience that so much um which is really sad it could be because they've streamlined cars better i don't know but there are science uh, papers out about the insect populations plum plummeting um is actually the words they used Another consideration is their uh, very long migration route and um, the whole way down from South East Africa. Um, that's a lot of sky to travel through and with increased um, frequency of uh, storms and um, kind of freak weather conditions from climate change, their migration is a little bit under threat. So you might have seen last year, um, last April, a lot of, of the Apsapis, the common swift were blown onto Greek islands. Um, and a lot of them ground onto the ground, dehydrated, starving, and again, aren't, aren't able to um, push off from the ground and fly again. Um, so that was very sad. And it was a, a storm that blew them there. Um, what we do know for sure is that uh, their habitat availability um, decreasing is really impacting the population. Um, uh, they nest under eaves. Um, in buildings and that unfortunately is being um, developed uh, that might be for roof renovation repairs and um, different things like that and we have this really bittersweet situation where obviously insulation is fantastic for climate change and reducing heat loss but it can come at a cost of the swift nest unintentionally being destroyed um, generally a lot of development doesn't really consider nature at the minute and that is hopefully changing but um swift bricks is a really good opportunity to put in more uh, homes for swift and basically looks like a normal brick in the outside but there's a chamber between the the brick wall and the inside wall um where the swifts can have a nest so it's a really fantastic solution where both humans can live there and the swifts and um, the final thing that can happen is demolition without realizing there's swift nest boxes there. I really like to believe in the goodness of humans and it's all um, when nests get destroyed, it's an accident rather than on purpose. Um, so that was all very depressing, but now we'll focus on positive things and solutions and what can be done for the swifts. Um, it's a very colorful diagram uh, representing the different seasons of the year. And the nice thing about the swifts is that there's something that can be done at all times of the year. Um, so if you look at the top here, prepare for the arrival of the swifts, that's where we are now. The, the change between spring and summer, though it still feels like winter, but let's not get into that too much. Um, the things that we're looking at being able to do just now are the swift surveys. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a little minute. Um, and then the swift leaves at the end of July and August. In the autumn, we can think about uh, planting a swift nest box or planting wildflower seeds. Um, in the winter, we can think about making a swift nest box. Um, oh, my screen's not working. Oh. Hmm. Nick, are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Katie. Katie. My whole screen is just like gone white. <laughs> You're, you've gone black on the camera, but uh, your screen is still, still showing here. Okay. Okay, and it's still moving if I do that. Yeah, okay. Okay, I can see half the screen. I should still be able to keep going. So in the winter, we can also do tree planting. Um, and then the spring, again, is a good time to plant the wildflowers, which is for the insects, um, and install the swift nest box. So that's what I've been doing a lot the last few weeks. Um, again, throughout the year, things that we can consider um, are climate change, being pesticide free, so to help the insect population, um, and also to protect the nest, which again, we'll get onto that with the surveys. So basically, the 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 um the point of this is to be like there's lots of things that can be done um at all times of the year which can be quite hopeful 
Um, one of the things that have has come out of this project and the way that we've been able to implement a lot of these um, different things to happen throughout the year is through the SWIFT local group. Um, this is the general aims to it. There's been monthly meetings and trainings um, and uh, we're hoping that after my funding's um, finished that the SWIFT local group will continue on. Um, it's in line with different, it's the first one in Edinburgh, but there are Swift local groups all over um, the UK and into Europe as well, which is really lovely to be part of that wider network as well. Um, within the Swift local group, there's different things. There's the casework team, as I said, that they uh, look at challenging different planning applications and asking people to consider Swift nest boxes or um, saying if there's a roof development that do you know the Swift nest boxes there kind of thing to raise awareness in that way. There's a creative team, social media team, and the habitat enhancement team as well, looking at um, the wildflower seeds. Um, there's three tiers of involvement. So there's the SWIFT supporter, the SWIFT advocate, and the SWIFT conservation leader. SWIFT supporter basically does uh, two actions for SWIFTs. So that could be to do a survey in the summer and tell one other person about SWIFT. So very easy, don't have much time, can do that. The SWIFT Advocate does maybe four things for the SWIFT, so looking at the nest box, the wildflower meadow, and uh, mo monitoring a nest over the winter. Um, whereas the conservation leaders, they come to all the monthly meetings, um, run surveys in their community, and um, tell everyone about SWIFTs, and maybe work on, the, on one of the working groups. So I'm giving you a lot of that is this quote, which says, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. So if you just replace that for swift conservation or conservation in general, we don't need a handful of people, a handful of people doing conservation perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. Um, and in that way, uh, swift conservation becomes more accessible to people. Even if you do one survey in a year, that's still contributed to swift conservation and um, still really important to the populations. Um, so I wanted to give you a few examples of things that have been happening in Edinburgh. Um, we might have some people that have um, actually carried through some of these things that have happened around Edinburgh. Um, I'm not sure if they're there or not. Um, but we've been working with eco congregations within Edinburgh and Scotland um, to install swift nest boxes. We've been locally sourcing the nest boxes. So both St Mary's and St Ninian made their own nest boxes. And um, Tipperith is a community for adults with um, uh, assisted needs. And they have a woodworking section. So they're at the minute making swift nest boxes to sell at their summer fair. Uh, the Forge is a local woodworking group and they made the nest boxes um, for me. Harmony School is a school out in Belerno, a um, really wonderful school, and they've made their own nest boxes as well. Um, we're also doing something called Swift Streets, um, and that's in Ratho and Meadowbank. And then, um, yeah, there's just different groups around um, Edinburgh and Glasgow that have been engaging with the Swifts. So I wonder if Elaine is here. Can I embarrass you, Elaine? You can totally ignore me if you don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> I'm not sure. She said she might be here. No. Um, but this is St Mary's Cathedral and this is in the bell tower. Um, and they put up 48 nest boxes, um, which is absolutely fantastic. The, the hope for the project was maybe 15 nest boxes would go up um, and they went and triple, almost tripled it, which is really wonderful. And they custom made their own nest boxes. So each of these boxes is divided into six. It's got six little chambers for the Swifts, uh, custom built for their louvres. Um, so obviously it's kind of hard to see what actually happens here, but the, the little hole into the Swift nest is at the front of the box um, and the Swifts fly up into the louvres and land there. Um, because there haven't been recently nested Swifts here, um, there has been a Swift collar that's been installed here as well that will hopefully attract Swifts to come and check out these nests and hopefully over time fill them all up. Um, and that's just in the bell tower. Um, the bottom right here is St Ninian's and they put up five nest boxes um, on the front uh, and they look really wonderful. They've even got a wee strip above the houses to protect um, the entrance into it from weather. 
And then on the left here is um, a nest box going up in the forge, and that's the woodworking face that built all of our nest boxes. Um, so that's also a very exciting thing that's happened. Um, this is what we did this week. So if, just on the bottom there, those are the swift nest boxes that were made by the forge, bottom left. Um, and these are them being put up in a street in Ratho. Um, and I was just saying to Nick before people came on there, but that was my first time seeing Swifts just this week. And what, literally while we were putting them up for the first time, six Swifts appeared. Um, at the bottom of this ladder here is Gordon, and he he owns that house that we're putting the, the nest boxes onto. And he's been there for 30 years and they've come every year. Um, and he had tears in his eyes and I had tears in my eyes and it was all very emotional and exciting. Um, but it was really wonderful to see somebody have that connection to the Swifts and to really look forward to their return in, in, in the summer. And why they're called Swift Streets is that we've got multiple houses in the one street to put up Swift boxes, so also the same in Meadowbank. And um, they also do things where they've got very abundant gardens, um, so lots of plants. Um, and both in Ratho and Meadowbank, the, um, they're going for pesticide free. Um, so there's a lot of dandelions, um, for example, growing through the edges and they're trying to use alternatives to pesticides such as manually removing things. Um, and yeah, it just basically makes it a very abundant place for the Swifts to be. Um, so that's like all the information out of the way. The next half of the um, meeting is more going to focus on uh, ways that you can help. So look at more detail about the SWIFT surveys um, and some other things. But I just wonder at this point, maybe I could give a couple of minutes for some questions and anything so far. Just for a bit of not just me monologuing at you. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Katie. Um, if participants have a question, they can either unmute themselves and ask the questions directly or, or type it into the chat. <clears throat> and uh, and I will be very happy to to read them out. Yeah. So Katie says so, so that you know I think people were unable to unmute themselves until now. So I think yeah, that's why you, you weren't getting the, the the interactions that you may may have wished. Oh no, that's uh, yeah. It's yeah. hard to interact with forty people as well. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> it was a um, yeah. self reflecting questionnaire. <laughs> yeah. No. Just. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I really enjoyed the uh, the breadth of uh, of actions you've you've taken. Uh, just like from the from the arts with the poems to uh, all the you know more techie and so, so. We've got a first box, uh, a first question. Sorry, and it's about the swift boxes. Mm -hmm. How far apart do they? Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. um, can yeah, you read, you read the question too. Yeah, just, yeah uh, I so, can read them. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, um. So uh, Anne and be... Rona, I can get on to those questions in this next bit with the Swift um, nest box, the, the height, how close, that type of thing. I can let you know in this next little bit. Um, and Sue, how many Swifts come to Edinburgh each year? Hmm. That's a good question. I'll also tell you just now about Swift Mapper, which is a map that has um, recorded sites of Swifts nesting and screaming parties being sighted. Um, which I'll explain a wee bit more about. My Zoom's frozen again. I hope that you can still hear me. <laughs> yeah, no, we, um, can still, we can still hear you. Mm -hmm. So strange, it's not happened before. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that gives you a really good indicator of how many Swifts are there, but it is hard to tell exactly how many um, come back. But it's really it's a really lovely map to look at because you can see on your street, are there Swifts nesting there kind of thing. Um, so I'll give you information about that. And I'll get, yeah, we'll talk about the best position for the Swift. Maybe I'll just go on ahead into that bit because that seems to be a lot of the questions. You've got a couple more, maybe you could that try, like, yeah, say so. Maybe oh, we could, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe three more now. Best so questions are, the questions are coming in. So uh, you, you can yeah, pick, yeah, pick, yeah. Pick, pick up on them at a later stage if you so wish. You just, yeah, just yeah, I'll yeah. leave it to you. But, um, We'll yeah. make sure to try and answer all of these questions. Hmm. Um, Jean, the, uh, this project only started um, last July. So hopefully there will be a decline 
in um or the slowing in the, in the decline but it's not something we would be able to tell um for a while but 48 nest box is going up on one location and i'm aiming for 100 by the end of the season kind of thing so um and given that that would be like one family and then they'll have eggs and it can be quite exponential the protection for them as well then hopefully um it will slow the decline um alan the best place to see um oh so you know along the harrison park along the canal that's a really good place um duddingston lock anywhere around arthur's seat um basically green areas because they like or water areas where they go to feed or drink um i was out in ratho whenever i saw the ones this week and they were saying they just they're just swooping and flying all of summer um, and they've got fields all around them and, and water um, areas as well where they come and feed. Um, you can see them up in the reservoirs in, Pent in the Pentlands as well. Um, what variety of insects do they eat? So they eat flying insects um, um, and there was research into it like 20 years ago and the the what was found in their mouth was like um butterflies dragonflies hoverflies were a big one lots of hoverflies normal flies midges um that for some, like basically because it's uh was such a long time ago it's now become outdated and um, so you're meant to just say flying insects but that's what was in the swift's mouth 20 years ago i don't think it would have changed that much because they've evolved <laughs> a lot um longer ago um, what are they predated by en route in Africa? Yeah, so great thing about the swift is that they are really fast and agile um, and they don't actually have heaps of predators. Um, there might be, on in, from a Scotland perspective, peregrines um, would be their most likely predators, but you're asking en route from Africa, I don't know, maybe eagles um, that would be done there, but I'm not sure about what they would encounter in Africa, actually. It's a good question. I'm quite interested to learn that now. How do you stop other birds like sparrows and blue tits using that? Yeah, <laughs> using the swift nest boxes. That's a really good question as well. Um, you kind of can't. Well, the swift nest boxes, they their holes are smaller. Um, so that excludes, yeah, that doesn't exclude the sparrows or blue tits. Um the sparrows do nest before the swifts, so sometimes in some situations the sparrows use a nest box and then the swifts use the nest box. Blue tits don't tend to go into them, they just prefer the smaller ones. The swift nest boxes, as you saw, are about 35-40 um, centimetres long, um, which is much bigger than what the blue tits are used to. Um, at the same time, I'm quite into if it's protecting a bird species, that's fantastic. I mean, obviously, it depends what what bird it is but um the sparrows and blue tits are under threat as well well sparrows more than blue tits um so if it does provide a nest for them then to me i think that's also great you could if you wanted to block it off until the swifts get back which is around now um so they couldn't actually get into it um do they come back to the same areas to nest or even the same nest box exactly yeah rona they do they um the adults come back year after year to the same nest box and the babies go back to where they were born to make their own nest box. Um, so we'll get on to that just now because I think I want to get through the rest of it and I don't want to hold you back too long at the end. Um, so we'll come back to the questions, but hopefully a lot of the questions will be answered just now. Um, Rona's one as well. Okay, so we're going to think about swift surveys now and this is what we're asking people to do now in the summer while the swifts are back. So what that looks like is ah, another quiz, just in case you've forgotten about what the Swift is. So if you didn't get it right last time, see if you remember. This is the Swift, this is the Swallow, and this is the House Martin. Um, so doing a Swift survey basically means to look for where Swifts currently live um, and add it to the Swift Mapper um, website. And that really helps us focus our conservation efforts because we know where the swifts are, we know what buildings to protect and we know what areas to look after. Um, I was up in Dunblane last week looking at swift nests and you would be really surprised at what sort of um, just how hidden they are on, on the side of buildings. So they can be really 
small under the tiles and um, in holes and walls on the edge of the roof space and under the eaves as well. So like we saw in the previous pictures as well, where they flew in under the eaves. Um, the best time to see them flying into their nest is around dusk and uh, dawn. So at dawn they go out to catch as many insects as possible for their young and or themselves and they come back at dusk um, to bring them back. Um, so this is the website of the map and um, this is what it looks like. It's got all the different places. Um, there is this little yellow symbol and that's a nest box. So that's a, a where swifts are nesting where they're sleeping. And um, the little blue symbol are screaming parties. And what screaming parties are, are lots of swifts together, literally having a screaming party. <laughs> um, and they make very high sounds. What they're doing with this screaming party is they're prospecting nests. So they might be birds nesting for the first time. They might be birds that have lost their nest. Um, but they basically fly around and might spy somewhere that looks like a good nest so they come up to it and they start screaming into the nest asking if there's anybody there and then if there's a bird inside then that, that, that bird's screaming back no go away and if there's not then they know that they can go into the nest um, and create their own own little home and um, so those are the two things that we're looking for on swift mapper both where they're nesting and if they're doing a screaming party just seeing a swift is very valuable information but it's not something we ask for on swift mapper but you can log it on bird track as a place to log the sightings of swifts and um, so if you do see a swift nest you can add it to the swift mapper and um, there's a little that yeah the little yellow icon um, and how you can protect the swift nest throughout the year is then to regularly check that site and make sure that it's safe. Um, if you become aware of development in the form of roof insulation, renovation or demolition, this is what to do. Um, we would invite you, if you feel able to, um, to speak directly to the homeowners, maybe you know them, um, and just let them know that there's swifts there. Um, and that way we can create conversations and raise awareness about um, the swifts and the importance of retaining every single nest that already exists. Um, there's four options that you can go through um, with the homeowner or the roofing company. And they are for gold award, um, is to leave the nest alone. That's the, the best thing that we can do for the swift conservation is know where the nests are and leave them alone. They've chosen those nests and in that way, it's the most possible suitable place for them to be. Um, obviously that's not always possible. So we go into the silver award um, and what we would ask for then is to not do the roofing development during swift nesting season. I'm sure as many of you know, it's illegal to disturb a wild bird's nest um, during nesting season. So that's from now until August. Um, and where the roofing has to happen, so outside of the swift nesting season, um, the best thing to do is to pr preserve the access holes or to make new ones that match exactly the swift nest in the past. So there's a really great example of that where some local people knew that there was swifts nesting in a local church and whenever they saw the scaffolding going up for the church to be repaired and the roof to be redone they just had a conversation with the roofers and they were heritage roofers so they were really on board to help the swifts and basically what they did is they still had to do the roofing works of course but they marked out where the swift nests were and whenever they put the tiles back on they were able to create the holes for the swifts to still be able to fly in and um, to the inside of the roof and the next year all the swifts came back and it was all all grand and they still have swifts that was five years ago and um, the final thing that um, we would ask that if the roof work still has to go through and they're able to show that they won't um, disturb the nests during swift season um, that there needs to be an assurance that the entrance into the swift holes won't be covered up so that could be from netting or from the scaffolding whichever it is um, and if they need to destroy the swift nests then to add a swift nest box um, externally in the appropriate way so we'll go through the conditions in a wee moment um, where you might come under people not being up for that and um, you can um, quote that in the law the birds are actually protected 
So it is, um, as I said, illegal to damage or destroy or otherwise interfere with the nest of a wild bird while it's in use or being built. So that's now. And um, it's against the law to recklessly obstruct or prevent any wild bird from using its nest, destroy the egg of a wild bird. And um, so there is legislation to back up our um, protection of the swifts, which is a relief because, yeah, I'm also working with developers and um, the roofing companies and scaffolding co companies and most like they're generally really on board. And um, but it, sometimes if they <laughs> aren't quite listening to what we're saying, it is actually in in legislation. And these are different examples of what of a person made a uh, swift nest box, things that can be added on to development. So the bottom right is the external swift nest box. Um, the bottom left is the swift brick. Well, as I was saying, it's a brick and it's got a chamber in the inside. The top right is the sofa design. And what we have here, so I can answer some of these questions, is that the, it's the whole sofa and it's partitioned into different nest boxes. So they're literally right beside each other. And um, there is research that shows that the swifts don't mind being right beside each other. They um, evolved in colonies um, and on uh, sea cliffs. So sometimes the holes were right beside each other. They don't mind. Um, the top left are the gable ends where they put holes um, in the wall and then on the inside of the wall, similar to the example of the church, they've got lots of different um, nest boxes all side by side. Um, I would love to see that house now if it was, uh, if I had Swift in it. Um, these are some things that you can add to the uh, homemade Swift nest boxes. If you're interested, we have a recording of a workshop to make the Swift nest boxes. Um, there's instructions on the RSPB website. You can also add these little um, squares in the inside um, to prevent the, net, the eggs rolling out. The Swifts will naturally make something like that anyway, but it can just help them along. And um, so here's the conditions uh, to consider when putting up a nest box. So um, for the Swift nest box to be five meters away from a tree that might um, host predators, to be five meters high. So as I was saying about the wee legs being quite weak, though they've got strong um, feet, they can't propel themselves out. So whenever they go to fly, they kind of do this mad somersault out the swift nest box and swoop down the way and then swoop up again. And um, so they need five meters at least, or 4.5 4 to five meters of um, space beneath the nest boxes. So say you had a chimney, but one foot, one meter beneath the chimney was the roof. That wouldn't be a suitable location. It needs to be straight drop um, of four to five meters. Um, other things to consider are to not put the nest boxes above the window. Um, that can lead to disturbance from the window. And the final thing is thinking about the direction of the sun. So we recommend putting especially external nest boxes on the um, north facing. Northeast, northwest is also fine. This is ideally, um, and it's to avoid the nest box overheating in the summer, um, which has been shown to uh, affect the swifts. Uh, tips to improve success. So as I said, the babies go back to where they were born to um, nest themselves. So if you've never had any swifts anywhere near you, um, they might not know that you've put the nest box up for them. Um, but what you can do to um, help them is to add a um, swift collar. So that's what St Mary's have put up in their church where it gives out the sound of the swift um, parties, the screaming parties, and the swifts kind of get a bit interested and come and check it out and then they will be able to find the nests that are there. Um, and just another way as well, if you make a nest box and then um, know somebody else for the house, you can just check in Swift Mapper if there's any Swift's nesting close by to there, and then you'll know that that's a, there's more chance of the swift nest box being um, taken up because there's nests close by. Um, there's further links that I can send in an email after this about where to get the attraction call CDs, swift call instructions, um, or a swift call system. So just on the final few slides here, um, I think I've gone over it a little bit. I hope that's okay. Um, but what we're asking people to do is to spread awareness about the SWIFT. Um, so uh, as was mentioned as well, they, they bring hope and inspire many. There's so many poems and stories written about the SWIFT songs as well. And they're associated with summer returning. They come back now whenever um, it actually is summer. So 
there's folklore around them bringing summer essentially and um, so it's a nice little anecdote about them and I think we could all use a bit of hope and inspiration uh, with life right now maybe <laughs> it's been a hard year um, so what we are doing is launching a um, creative campaign um, that was launched on the 1st of May and that closes on the 21st of June and it's basically inviting people to send in swift and inspired uh, artwork so that could be art, that could be poems, that could be stories, um, that could be songs, that could be a sculpture. Um, and we're going to host them online um, during Swift Awareness Week, um, which is in July. Um, so if you feel inspired uh, to do any of the above, um, you can send it to the Edinburgh Swift Local Group. Um, and yeah. You can try your hand at writing a swift haiku as well if, if you fancied. Um, again, I can give information at the end of that of this as well. Um, very, very, very final slide is that there was a study by the Brit British Ecological Society um, that was saying about how the baseline understanding of what nature is has shifted so much um, in the past three generations. Um, kids understanding now of what nature is is just so different to um 50 60 70 years ago and um, so we're trying to look at that and tackle that by interviewing people that are 50 years and over um about what nature what their experience of nature is um what they remember as children growing up and um, if they remember swift populations growing up as well and um, if you would like to be interviewed, please get in touch and um, a volunteer will phone you for a 20 minute conversation um, and we'll ask you these questions. Um, and yeah, um, there'll be a little video made of all um, the different things and things that you might take for granted or think might not be relevant really are like some little anecdotes I've heard from some people are really lovely to hear. Um, so yeah, I'd invite you to get in touch. Okay, that's me. I'm sorry for going over so much. No, no, thank you, uh, Katie, for, for all of this. Maybe you could put your email address for the Edinburgh group in the chat because uh, yeah. like that, I think people could copy and paste it. Most people are watching this from a computer, so they could just yeah. use it if they wanted to. Uh, a few questions are coming in. Uh, so, do you want me to read it or can you read it? <laughs> can you yeah. Read it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, Rona has another question and she said she's had a look at the Swift, uh, Swift map. If it's got a nest recorded, does that mean someone already monitors it or do they need watched? Mm -hmm. um, highly likely it's not been monitored. Um, there, yeah, I think that the amount of people that are, have said that they'll do that is maybe 20 or 30 people in Edinburgh. So I think the likelihood of it um, being that one, I don't have a way to check it because it's it's talks like this where people then might tell me in four months they've been looking at one swift nest and there's not really a way um, or a process to work that out. Um, but it definitely, it, it, the, on, on the swift map it just means that somebody knows that there's a swift nesting there and they've logged it on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're watching it beyond that um one thing about the swift mapper is that you can click on the icon and you can see the date that the swift nest is there so it might be from four years ago but it might be from last year kind of thing um so even going to check that one out and updating the information like yeah the swift's nested here again this year and um, is also really useful one thing i would also say about the swift mapper is that it's completely biased to people that know about it and um, so if you look at it on an edinburgh scale and then like yeah basically i went to areas where there was apparently no swifts but i, I find swift nests kind of thing and um, so it's not necessarily exactly reflective of where there there aren't swifts and um, it's just reflective of who knows about the swift mapper and um, so if you felt really inspired you can go to areas on the swift mapper that don't have any recordings and look around there and um, that's really useful um, for us thank you uh, any further questions we have for katie Still digesting the information overload. <laughs> yeah, oh no, but they they did. They, 
<laughs> Everyone asked quite a few questions, uh, you know, halfway through. Yeah, so I yeah, think, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, a lot really. of the questions. I really like the uh, the press up facts you had of the <laughs> other Swiss in the list. That's quite amusing. Yeah, uh, just, uh, I do yeah. that with kids. It's like, okay, now it's four weeks and they're doing press ups. Now it's six weeks. Now they're going to fly and stuff. Yeah. It's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Um, okay. Um, I think if there aren't any any further questions, I think we're gonna um, I'm gonna uh, thank you, uh, Katie, an awful lot uh, for your uh, fascinating talk on Swifts, and I mm. wish you very well with your uh, the project this year, and, uh, and, and and to the local group as they carry on your work uh, that you've established, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, no, so do do get in touch with uh, Katie if you want to, or the living group or the local group, sorry, if you want to get get involved, uh, mm. and uh, thanks very much for for joining us tonight and um, yeah, have a good evening you. yeah thank you and just that that talk is or the interviews as well um yeah we're really welcome to come because we we are looking for people so yeah no. <laughs> yeah that sounds like a very interesting project yep. yeah right thanks okay. thank you everyone good evening everyone <laughs>